Well, this morning I arrived at our office, our studios here, uh, to discover no plunger coffee left. And I sat there and I thought, I wonder if there's a technology that could have alerted a delivery of coffee before it ran out. Well, I understand that that's actually a world we already live in. And on Sunday, my food bag arrived at the door with the raw ingredients to feed the dietary requirements of three very different adults' needs within my household. And I dreamed of a monthly personalised menu for every single member uh, based on the full dietary requirements, you know, potentially on our genetics and our goals. Well, I understand that that is actually a world we already live in too. So just because it's a moonshot from the world we live in daily here in New Zealand doesn't mean that it's a moonshot from the world that we actually sell our food and fibre into. Joining us now to navigate uh, the good news and opportunities amongst the reality is KPMG's Insight Analyst, Jack Keys. Jack, thank you so much for your time joining us here on Sarah's Country. Let's start by painting the picture of uh, how you see the world being uneven in the way that it's developing? Yeah, well, we know that there's a lot of different consumers around the world. We have a broad spectrum everywhere from those who are eating for sustenance and survival to those who are eating for entertainment and uh, everything in between. And so some of those markets, uh, the frontier markets, like you mentioned in your introduction, parts of India, Asia and Africa, uh, are just still increasing their demand for red meat and dairy and, and more quality uh, nutrition that's more traditionally what we'd produce in New Zealand. Whereas some of those uh, more uh, forward-thinking, emerging diet patterns from uh, wealthy Western societies are starting to move beyond that and even beyond looking for the sustainability tick but into what's a, a more personalised offering in their food. So when we have an emerging markets such as uh, India and Africa and Asia who have um, y- you know, a majority of population of the world, emerging middle class and their appetite for our sort of ingredients-based proteins, why do we need to concentrate on the rate of change happening in more affluent countries uh, and, and how do we put our focus on it when um, the attractiveness of you know, our reliance on some of these emerging markets um, has underpinned our economy in the past decade? Yeah, absolutely. And that's why it's worth recognising just the significant achievement of our farmers and growers and our industry in producing food that's very environmentally sustainable, very nutritious, uh, and is already world leading in quality. And uh, But the other thing we need to recognise is that con- the consumer is always evolving. And so the consumption and evolution that's happening in those uh, emerging markets is following the trajectory that the um, that our Western consumers followed. And that means that if our Western consumers are then leading into a more personalised and further um, requirements in their diet, these emerging markets will in the future too. So though at the moment, even in the foreseeable future, uh, we look to be in a very strong position in our markets, I think that there is a place for us to start being a bit proactive into what the future of food is going to look like when we start looking at more synthetic nutrition. Otherwise, there will be a a point in time, and it's not a case of uh, if, but when, uh, that type of diet is, is commonplace around the world. How? What do you believe New Zealand's role is in uh, a food system that has nutrition glorow in, in a lab? Well, I think uh, there's a case for us to have both to, and to focus on both. It would be silly to ignore our current uh, farming practices, which are already world-leading, and ignore the, the growing opportunity in some of those frontier markets. But at the same time, I do think that there's an excellent opportunity for New Zealand to uh, look at investment and being, again, proactive in the type of lab-based synthetic foods. And that's Due to the same competitive advantage we have in more traditional agriculture, the fact that we have excellent natural resources here in New Zealand and we have a very innovative uh, and a great culture for food. So when we look at synthetic nutrition and cellular ag, if you really dive into the science, at the moment they really struggle to be environmentally competitive with traditional agriculture because they're extremely energy intensive. And though there's some pretty high tech science happening, 
the laws of physics aren't going to be broken anytime soon. And so the, the law of energy conservation, you're going to have to have inputs to create these food outputs. And uh, energy is a significant input in these foods. And that's something New Zealand has an abundance of and can capture a lot more of. So I think our role is to look at how we can invest a lot more into renewable energy production and storage so that we could be an excellent innovation hub to start um, producing some of these uh, synthetic foods and they can complement the diets of of some of these higher and more affluent consumers in addition to still being able to offer the top quality nutrition that we already offer. What I'm hearing from you, Jack, is it's about sort of having a foot in both camps and an attitude uh, that uh, landowners here in New Zealand can benefit from both. I feel like that's where the threat is coming from, is that um, the as you said, synthetic nutrition that's coming is is not something that uh, uh, our landowners can actually have an investment of or a foot in that camp. Yeah, exactly. It's scary and it's a strange world because a lot of it still is in such early development. Uh, We don't see much of it, if any, in New Zealand shores. And to think of meat literally being grown in a lab just does still seem like a sci-fi type situation. But that's where the fact that we do have such a strong launch pad and successful industry now gives us an excellent opportunity to be proactive in this space because otherwise other countries will become the leaders in, in that space and there's no reason that New Zealand can't lead both uh, traditional farming and more modern type of food uh, and food innovation that's going to come. Do you believe that uh, there will be a change in business models uh, to have a multi-scape diverse uh, business if you do own a piece of land and how do you believe um, those business models may develop from what you're seeing? Yeah, absolutely. So in particular for those landowners, um, there's going to be more and more opportunities for integrating with renewable energy production uh, that's getting more and more cost effective uh, and uh, and more efficient. And so we're already seeing farms in New Zealand. I think the biggest solar farm uh, up in Northland is, is now underway or at least being planned. And so solar energy, wind energy, and of course, opportunities with hydroelectricity as well, all renewable energy options to build into uh, our business models and then being able to not only be selling meat, dairy and horticultural products, but also selling energy. Um, and likely um, with a lot of these synthetic nutrition production, that is a baseline of, of actual meat or dairy products as well. So uh, a combination of providing uh, cells or parts of the animal and horticulture products and then the energy to produce uh, more food, it's all going to come down to landowners because a land is required to produce that energy. How do you believe that we can, as you see it in your uh, Farmers Weekly pulpit opinion piece, articulate our aligned value proposition uh, as something that New Zealand's primary sector uh, has really struggled with in the structure of our food production system being in sub-sectors? Yeah, I think that's quite a challenging one because in principle, there's a a lot of alignment across our sectors in terms of looking to um, focusing on climate change and environmentally efficient production, um, focusing on the sort of taglines like being uh, the country that produces the best food for the world. Um, But at the same time, uh, a lot of that often isn't backed up by real investment and real commitment and it often is sort of what we see in the top line headlines but isn't actually being implemented in action and so what uh, we could really do with is a, a look at these types of disruptive technologies which are going to impact all of our primary sectors and see where there's opportunities for collaboration through collaborative investment alongside government to start introducing opportunities to, to invest there and again 
be proactive with those opportunities where we know that the world is heading to those types of nutrition and there's a chance for us to be a leader in that space. What do you believe uh, we need to do to achieve what you suggest we can achieve, which is to be not only the New Zealand version of Silicon Valley of food and fibre, but actually better, be that global future uh, food hub? How do we achieve that uh, when you know there is a rate of change which is going faster than us in this particular field of food innovation in other parts of the world already? Yeah, well, on the first hand, we often talk about how we're so capital limited in New Zealand, but really there is uh, quite a lot of investment opportunity through New Zealand um, Kiwi Savers, through uh, just wealthy individuals and companies, and, and there is a reasonable amount of New Zealand investment capital available. Though if we do compare that to what's available overseas, uh, there is a lot of international investment capital capital available as well. So I think it's a balancing act of um, looking at putting some skin in the game and putting some investment in both through government and through our own uh, investment opportunities and then also attracting international investment through uh, collaborative relationships. We do it quite well offshore when we're looking at selling our products, but we could do it better. There's some good examples and some not so good examples. We could do that also onshore as well with production and look at bringing over um, and hosting basically the IP of some of these Silicon Valley companies who are working and cellular ag and being a launch pad for them while also bringing the jobs, uh, the production and a lot of the economic benefit uh, to us here in New Zealand. And that would be through offering incentives through government. Uh, that would be through providing this platform of a more collaborative industry so that uh, it's just the obvious place for international innovators to come when they're looking at uh, making a big investment for future food production. And I guess the important thing is that this is the type of products and nutrition that will disrupt our industry so at some time in the future so it just makes sense for us to be a part of that disruption so that we can help disrupt ourselves rather than let others disrupt us fantastic i absolutely love that line and what an opportunity too with uh the popularity of new zealand and investing here in you know one of the the least corrupt uh, countries in the world uh that has been able to navigate our economic growth through uh, a a very disruptive time globally and there is so much interest yet we have the most tightest uh, land investment laws for overseas investment but that doesn't mean we start, still can't uh, attract and retain that capital from overseas in other ways is what I'm hearing from you. Yes, that's absolutely right. Uh, though uh, foreign entities may not be able to invest uh, directly into land, there's definitely opportunities for either those opportunities to be made more available or for us to have creative ways of, uh, of developing collaborative relationships so that our land uh, can be used for investment through our own ownership, but they're investing capital to develop the type of facilities that are required, which are very uh, expensive and capital intensive um, structures to set up when you're looking at actually uh, putting on that stainless steel and, and those bioreactors to grow the synthetic nutrition. There's a lot of investment, but there's plenty of room in New Zealand to host that and power that. And I think that's one thing, the key thing that I took away from your pulpit is that the story that we're missing here is our energy story. It's um, uh, the ability to sell the the fact that we are positioned as a world leader in renewable energy and getting very close to that target of 100% renewable. Uh, and the footprint of the food is the story. Um, and yeah, fantastic. Thank you so much for expanding our minds, Jack, as always. Uh, and I always thoroughly enjoy following uh, your career and your thoughts and your work. Uh, really looking forward to KPMG's Agribusiness Agenda into 2021. Have we got some good things to look forward to in June? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, looking at consumers, looking Looking at the future of food, uh, these sorts of sections and topics are going to be key focus in the agenda this year. So certainly something to look forward to. Of course, we'll be unpacking that here on Serious Country, no doubt. Um, it's something I look forward to every year as well. Now, coming up in Serious Country to unpack the messages from Jack is a woman that never fears providing a very strong opinion on the direction of New Zealand's food and fibre sector, NZX uh, Head of Analytics, Julia Jones, up here next on Serious Country. 
Oh, nice boots. Yeah, thanks. They're new. <laughs> ben, Ben, you alright? Oh, yeah, sorry, mate. Just smear cutting pretty hard, eh? Yeah. I just said to myself, Ben, work hard. You deserve new boots. 